rain fed rivers. So not all our rivers are glacier fed. Many of them are fed by springs and uh, rain. This is a small river called the Kosi and Almora town gets its water from this uh, river. Here's a graph which is the a graph of the low season flow uh, around May of every year. Uh, this friend of ours takes readings at a particular spot and you'll see that from about 1000 liters per second, the flow has dropped to about 100 liters per second. Over the period of 1992-93, 2004 and the same graph has continued to 2013. I don't have time to put that one out. So that's a state of many of the rivers in the Himalayan region that the base flows are declining. And the reason for that is also because the springs are drying up. We get rain, there's been a lot of deforestation in the Himalayan region and as a result, our springs are drying up. When the rain comes, most of it just runs down uh, the slopes. There's nothing to hold it back. And so we get lots of floods in the uh, monsoon season. And once the monsoon season is over, then our springs dry up fairly quickly. So many years ago, uh, we realized that our springs were drying up and we were working on some watershed projects in the Himalayan region. So the villagers said to us, Iska kuch ho nahi sakta hai. Iska kuch nahi kar sakte ho. So we said, okay, we'll try. And I had seen a paper written by some scientists from the Govind Balak Pant Institute. And I had seen this picture that they had uh, drawn. Now, that's a typical watershed. And these are streams that you can see. And what they had proposed was that you put a lot of trenches in the watershed. You plant trees and grasses um, and make a few check dams to hold the water back. And then you'll end up recharging the river. Their interest was in recharging the river. Our interest was in recharging springs. Now a spring doesn't have a very big watershed. Huh? It's watershed, it's spring shed as we call it is probably uh, two to five hectares. Not a very big project, right? So let's try this out. And we tried that out in the first year. Uh, this was before the uh, treatment. This is the hydrograph. Uh, water discharge on the y-axis, different months on the x-axis. And you can see that after the uh, treatment, the discharge levels have gone. Now, unfortunately, we were new to the game at that time. We forgot to record the rainfall. We'll see what happens when rainfall is also plotted on this. So, this excited us a lot. Ki ek saal ke andar andar, with very little money, we've been able to recharge the spring. Okay. So, there was a there is a gentleman called Sandeep Tambe. Also an IIT Bombay product. Has he ever come here? He has. Huh? Not to sit. Ah, you should invite him. So Sandeep Tambe is a Indian Sikkim. Forest Service. He somehow heard about us and he <coughs> said, uh, you know, Sikkim has got two dry districts and a lot of our springs have dried up over there. So can you come and demonstrate your technique over here? Which we did. And uh, he was quite excited and he went ahead with the he got the state to sponsor this uh, springs rejuvenation program and this is an idea you can see that the spring discharge literally after one year two times three times three and a half five times so that you get to see the results very quickly and that's always very exciting right you have to wait for a long period uh, so after this lot of other governments in the himalayan region have begun to approach us saying, come and help us with the revival of our springs. But before I tell you about those governments, here's a small case study from Himachal Pradesh. Uh, 
this work we have done with the help of uh, uh, Aquadan, a hydrogeology organization based in Pune, and they have helped us uh, in. Our work was basically like good engineers. You look at something, you try it out, you use some rules of thumb, and if it works, you go ahead with it. They brought science into our work. Okay, so let's see what they did. First of all, when we started work over there in uh, 2012, we, this is a gram panchayat with five uh, villages, and uh, that was the uh, water demand, the blue bars and the red bars are the water availability. So except for this village, all the others, the water availability is less than the demand. <coughs> so again, lots of springs, 12 springs in this water, in this uh, Gram Panchai. Uh, we talked to the villagers, we told them that it's possible to revive your springs, increase your water supply and they agreed to work with us. So, uh, with the help of Aquadam, we first tried to study the hydrogeology of that area by looking at the geological structures at the ground and marking the spring sheds. These red lines which you may not be able to see, uh, these are the spring sheds. And then we began the treatment of these spring sheds. And as I said, gadde khodne hai aur peer lagane hai, ghas lagane hai. Now, this is the record of uh, the bars are the rainfall, uh, how much rainfall we got. And this green uh, graph is of a spring that we treated. The red and the blue lines indicate two springs in the same village which we did not treat. So you can see the difference over the years. Um, in the dry month of um, May, if you look at May 13, driest period, it's down there, May 14, May 15, somewhere around here, but May 15 gets a lot of rainfall in between. <coughs> but overall you see that the discharge has been increasing every year. Were these uh, treated as subsets of a watershed or the two remain dealing? Uh, they, in this case, they are totally dealing. This was just spring shed treatment. There is no watershed program here. Uh, so these are the uh, different villages, different uh, springs that we uh, treated. And almost every case you will find that the uh, discharge level goes up. We threw in one which we had not treated, just for your reference. Now the other very interesting thing is that when we mark out the recharge area of a spring, we ask the villagers to treat this area like a sacred area. Hmm? And there will be no defecation either by the people or by their animals. So animals are also to be kept out of the city. The end result is that the fecal coliform content, you see the first year, the blue bars, and then after that the fecal coliform concentration comes down. Now this is also a side benefit and the third benefit that comes out of this treatment is the biomass availability. Before treatment, much of this area is a wasteland and you may have productivities of about 2 to 5 tons of biomass per annum. After treatment, the biomass availability will jump up to at least 15 to 20 uh, tons, though the potential is much higher. You could go up to about 40-45 tons per hectare. Okay? Uh, so, this is just to say that uh, several organizations have got together. We've done about 300 spring sheds so far. Uh, we've also come together to work with uh, the government of uh, Meghalaya now. And government of Meghalaya has a huge program. They want to treat 
thousands of springs. Okay? So, Siddhara people who may want to work with the government, there are going to be big opportunities in Meghalaya. Okay? Um, it's a very pretty state. Now we've got a program going with the government of uh, Nagaland. And just recently, it will be announced actually on the 9th of uh, November, which is the foundation day of Uttarakhand. The state government will uh, announce a state mission to divide springs in our state. Now, one of the advantages, our first focus is that if we have increased the water availability, then the first thing is to meet household needs. Very often that's not too much water. So we still have extra water. Then how do you use it? We uh, try and advocate the system of crop intensification. It's a process by which, it's a way of cultivating crops by which you can raise your crop productivity anywhere from 30-40% to over 100% and you can do it with less water. So, this is an example of uh, that kind of uh, work and you will see here, this is a stock of our uh, system of rice intensification and these are the conventional, uh, she is also holding the conventional and the SRI paddy stocks. Now, here's another very interesting uh, issue. <clears throat> this came to us from Madhya Pradesh. The district of Dhar in Madhya Pradesh, that one over there, is quite, uh, the groundwater is full of fluorides. And if you have too much fluoride in your water, then you have the disease of fluorosis. It starts out with discoloration of the teeth, yellow bands appear on the teeth and then gradually as your intake of the fluoride increases, then deformation of the limbs takes place. Okay. So here, when we looked at what was uh, happening, what were these people doing with the groundwater, we noticed that the wells which were only about 20 to 60 feet deep and you look at their fluoride content, it's less than 1 milligram per liter. That water was being used for irrigation. The hand pump and tube well water where the fluoride levels are very high, that's being used for drinking purposes. Okay, it should be the reverse. So here it was a fairly simple uh, approach. That's just uh, graphically showing that the well water, W1, W2, all the well water is quite below the acceptable limit of 1 milligram per liter. But the hand pump waters, the fluoride levels are very high. Here we worked in a few villages on a trial basis with about 4,000 families. And the approach was very simple. We monitored the fluoride content of all the water sources in the villages. And we then showed the results to the villagers and we showed them that, look, your dug wells don't have any significant amount of fluoride, the water is safe, why not use this for drinking? Now there just aren't enough drug wells in the village. So we had to bring the communities together to make agreements to use the dug wells only for drinking purposes. No more irrigation from dug wells. Okay? <clears throat> so here you see that um, um, what we did was after the agreements were reached, then we put in pumps into the dug wells and arrange to supply water at certain locations of the village so that the women don't have to walk too far and suddenly the um, distance that you have to walk decreases, the water available in the houses increases or the water consumed in the houses increases 
and um, the time spent to collect water comes down, the frequency of baths taken goes up. Unfortunately, I couldn't find the graph. We have another graph showing the results of urine analysis. And urine analysis show a very significant drop in the amount of fluoride left in the body. Okay? So here's a very simple approach. No big technology, nothing um, that costs too much money, but you bring the community together and they <coughs> do the rest of the work. Okay? So right now we are working with the uh, government of Madhya Pradesh to try and convert all the villages of Dhar district into uh, fluoride-free villages. Okay, so I guess that's the end of this show. If you have questions, I will be very happy to answer them. If you have other points for discussion other than water, I will be happy to discuss those also. Yeah. Um, also, can you uh, uh, just uh, uh, your name and the yes. PhD? Yeah. I am Parish, I am pursuing PhD uh, first year at uh, Sitara. Uh, now my question is now your work with uh, springs. Is it in uh, uh, conflict with states or the national government's priority of hydropower uh, generation? And if that is so, how is that conflict being managed? Okay. Uh, no, the springs work is not in conflict with uh, hydropower, though hydropower is in conflict with springs. <laughs> <laughs> In other words, as you saw in all those states, uh, we are working with the state governments. Because, see, the... Your name is Negi, right? What's your name? Tenzing. 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 Which village? Sir, Lohaghat. Lohaghat, yes sir. Now, he will tell you that in almost all Himalayan villages, the villagers don't depend on the big rivers for their water. They depend on these springs. Right? So, the state has to get involved with revival of springs because that's what the people have access to. But the states have interest in big rivers and big dams. And when you build dams, you put those tunnels, when you uh, when you dig a tunnel inside a Himalayan mountain, then you do a lot of blasting. When you do blasting, you disturb the fractures inside the mountains and that changes the direction of the water flow. So, very often springs that people are using go dry. So, at that stage, we come into conflict with the government. But we manage that conflict separately. <laughs> Back to that question about spring shed being a subset of a watershed. Uh, does it make sense to try out some places where uh, watershed can essentially be the summation of a large number of spring sheds? Take that up under Narega. Uh, because I, I guess the wage material ratio would be pretty favorable um, for spring sheds. Yeah. Uh, has it been tried out yeah. or is it worth trying out? The first, the first experiment that I showed you was done in a watershed program, okay? And later up to about 2012 or 13, we worked with the IWMP, Integrated Watershed Management Program, and we tried to convince different states that you now incorporate spring shed development into your programs. But you know that after the Modi government came in, IWMP funding was almost uh, abolished. So, there is very little watershed activity left now. But it can easily be integrated into watershed development. Okay? It can be done. I am Amandeep Singh, PhD in Chemical Engineering. We are working in water group in Tata Center. So, my question was that uh, where you have checked the fluoride content in some villages in MP. 
did you check some heavy metal content also? Uh, irrigated villages, not heavy agricultural villages, um, many of them are basically old forested villages. And by the way, that's a hint that uh, wherever forests have been cut down, there is a likelihood that there will be fluoride in the uh, soil over there. Um, but we do a lot of work on uh, identifying the presence of heavy metals in areas like um, uh, Raisin uh, district in uh, Madhya Pradesh where there's a lot of soybean cultivation, a lot of uh, fertilizers and pesticides being used. So there we find these problems, western UP and also places like uh, Badiba Rotiwala, Nalagad area of uh, Himachal Pradesh where industrial, is when, where industrial wastes are there. So, yeah, we do come across a lot of uh, heavy metal Initially, what we studied is that, uh, so when there was a study in West Bengal also, the, where arsenic problems started. So, basically, it was not because of agriculture, but there were some ponds in which the dissolved carbon content was very high. Mm -hmm. So, when they take water from agriculture, there was a seepage from the well, and due to that, there was some geo, uh, geothermal cycles which dissolved arsenic into the water yes. from their cell. So agriculture was not the main reason why arsenic and other heavy metals are into the water. Mm -hmm. so there is a myth also. Okay, I, I did not realize that you were including arsenic as a heavy metal. Uh, see, the arsenic problem of uh, West Bengal is actually due to the fact that that whole area has been crisscrossed by the Ganga Brahmaputra river system. Both these river systems have over geological time brought in a fair amount of uh, arsenic from the Himalayan slopes. So throughout the Gangetic uh, belt you will find uh, the problem. It's as far back as Haryana also where the old Yamna channels are, you will find arsenic problems over there. So that problem is largely a problem of the Gangetic belt, number one. Number two, it came to surface when I think sometime in the 1980s during the international decade of drinking water and sanitation, UNICEF pushed bore wells into this area. Until then people were using dug wells for water. Once you went deep into the soil, then you started to pull out arsenic uh, contaminated water. So, Wahhabi situation is very similar. So, we have not done much work with arsenic uh, contaminated waters as yet. So, what do you say the cause seems to be? Cause seems to be actually the carbon content in water, water is there. So, when it seeps down, it mm -hmm. starts microbial uh, <coughs> chain reaction. Mm -hmm. So there are six to seven reactions which starts in a soil. Soil already has, every soil has an arsenic content. Mm -hmm. So it starts dissolving into water. And that was the main reason. Actually there was a paper in 2009 that was the actual reason why West Bengal and other areas have arsenic into the water, going into the water. It was published in Nature Communication. So that was the main reason. Actually initially person thought that agriculture was due to heavy rice cultivation and all that. The seepage is there, but that was not the reason. Yeah, well, West Bengal didn't have much of the green revolution. So, there is no question of uh, chemicals uh, producing the arsenic and so on. Yeah. West Bengal had 5.9% uh, compounded growth in agriculture for over two decades. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether it qualifies for green revolution or not, that's a different thing. West Bengal saw uh, a lot of agriculture. That was the, uh, you know, the huge land distribution yeah, program. Yeah, but then 5.9% compounded growth over a period of two decades is yeah. Ritesh from Chitata. Uh, my question is not related to the uh, You mentioned uh, PSI is developing innovation league. And you also mentioned uh, they do innovation in social processes. 
I'm curious, Miss, what kind of so the background? He is with Rutac, Rural Technology Action Group, which also sort of tries to help NGOs with any. Yeah, yeah. So I know. Rupal is also here, no? Rupal. So they were in Rutac. I thought uh, Seema has also approached yes. them, or you have asked Seema to approach them. Yes. Huh? Yes. Seema Ravandale has right. come? Yeah. On SRI and okay. also on Amla. Okay. Um, to my mind, one of the biggest problems which hold up development is the poor institutional structure that we have in our rural areas. Uh, up until 1950 or so, we had a zamindar in most villages. The zamindar was an institution. The zamindar not only collected rent for the government, or the Raja, but the <coughs> Zamindar also ensured that the well was well maintained, that the forests were not uh, encroached upon, that the gochas were taken care of, etc., etc. So, if you have read the social science literature, there is that term called Leviathan. Uska danda chalta. So, once we abolished Zamindari in 1952, <coughs> then all this good stuff also went with the Zamindari. We did not replace the Zamindar with another social institution in the villages that would ensure that the natural resources are well maintained. And this led to a very rapid decline of our natural resource base. So, one of the things that we do is to ensure good village level institutions to manage these resources. And um, in fact, our first experiment of this sort was in 92-93 when there was a drought in Palamu district and we created something called the Sukha Mukti Aviyan, uh, in which we took a concept from Maharashtra, the idea of Pani Panchayats. And we tried to get the government to recognize the Pani Panchayats, which we had set up in 125 villages. There is not a small program. 125 villages, Pani Panchayats are set up and we told the government that you have to recognize them and you have to fund them to build earthen dams. Okay? so that their agriculture can survive. Now, this was a major innovation at that time. Even today, the government doesn't like to fund unregistered bodies. Okay. But then that led to the, if you see the structure of the uh, watershed management program, lot of ideas from the Palamu program have come there. Now, every village that we work in, we work on the concept of Gram Suraj Abhiyan. That the villagers, if they really want to develop, then they have to be self-governing. You can't wait for government funds to come and so on all the time. Jitna apne bal pe kar sakte ho karo. And manage it yourself. So, that's basically the social innovation part that we have done. Then this participatory groundwater management, the example that I gave you from you know, it's amazing that people don't like to share water. And eventually when you tell the villagers, yeah, this, uh, this uh, deformity of people's limbs and so on is not a curse of God. It is simply this problem of fluoride. So, people have not only given up their well water um, to the village, but between villages water is being shared now. So those are the kinds of social processes that we have. What about something like SRI? How did that, the SRI as an innovation, did you go to that 
SRI is an innovation. Um, SRI has come from abroad, right? Uh, Madagascar, Cornell, and then India. Uh, there, the innovation is of a different type. It's more of the technical scientific type, where you basically take some pilot plots, you demonstrate it on a pilot plot, and then you uh, try to convince the villagers that look, if it works on this pilot plot, it will work on your pilot plot also. But there are some interesting things when you have um, things like uh, SRI or you have, what's that, um, earthquake safe uh, building construction. Both of these processes, interestingly, they have six or seven <coughs> principles on which the process is based. One or two of them are critical. If you do one or two of those steps, your yield will go up 50% or your building will become much stronger. If you do all the six or seven steps, you have built in a fair amount of redundancy into your building. So if it's a very strong earthquake, you will still, the building will not collapse instantly and you may get a yield of about 100-120% in your crops if you follow all the six or seven principles. So the, uh, we leave it, one of the big lessons that we learned, uh, initially we used to be very unhappy when farmers would not follow all the six or seven steps. And we didn't realize that every farmer has his or her own compulsion, constraints, they can't follow all the steps, right? So we used to feel very unhappy and we used to say, Are, isne to kuch nahi kiya. That fellow got a 30% increase in yield, he or she is happy with the 30%. Uh, but we used to feel very unhappy. It's only after a while we realized that there are genuine constraints which uh, don't enable uh, everybody to follow the steps. So this is a problem with many people here yeah. who are working in the shallow soil. Yeah. See, they will only the the thing is that you have to uh, look for a certain combination of plants. But eventually, all these plants help you build up the soil layer, right? Um, so, I would, if I were to tackle that problem, I would first go and consult some uh, some grasses and go fodder and grasses wallas or valleys and ask them what will be best suited for this kind of climate and this kind of soil structure. So, one, one additional, where I, I can find details for, technical details about your intervention? About our interventions, go to our website, okay. yeah. People Science Institute. So, typically in the spring shed, how long do you think uh, the transit time of water to, for it to yield uh, returns or water returns in May or in March, right? So the transit time is about six to seven months, right? From the last rainfall to the time it has come out <coughs> in the spring. So Upna transit time, whether it was there, or how does the, so again, See, I'm, I'm, as you know that. Um, Especially in our area. So it is a small watershed, as you say, or yeah. a spring shed. Something. Yeah. Uh, most of the water flows out during the months. So, sometime after October, the there is a very sharp drop in the discharge rate. Mm -hmm. So, from November onwards, you begin to see that, you know, it's taking more longer and longer to fill up your bucket <coughs> of water. And by the time February rolls around, the 
discharge is really dropped down to less than 10% or so. And by end of March or so, many of these springs are dry. What happens in our case is that typically you will enhance the uh, low period discharge by about one and a half to two times after one year. After three or four years, you may get five times increments. So that process is an incremental process. And I can't tell you because we haven't followed any of our springs for more than five years. So, but the length of the spring chain will be about a kilometer or less? Length itna nahi, jitna area. It's the recharge zone. So, that, that I said is about two to five hectares typically. There's only one thing that you have to understand the hydrogeology, you have to know your geology. Because sometimes it so happens that supposing this is a mountain and you think that this recharge uh, is here, my spring is here, the recharge must be up there. What you may find is you did the recharge treatment here, nothing came out because there is a fracture that has taken the water to the other side. So you have to study the geology reasonably well um, before taking this out. Yeah, uh, I am from Karnataka government. I am a forest officer and I have come very late for your lecture but I could gather whatever questions are being asked. So my question is, uh, we are all aware that rain water harvesting, it is free from, the water that is harvested is free from geogenic contaminants. Right. And even though we are talking about arsenic and uh, chloride, whether uh, any effort has been made to integrate this technology use of this technology along with what work you are doing presently yeah. in order to you know, address the issue of uh, right. heavy metals. Then moreover, if we store it at the higher elevation, green water, it is a zero gravity water, then energy can be saved. Yes. So I just wanted to hear from you if any experiences you have by integrating this technique. Because in Karnataka it is picking up well. I have no idea about other states. No, rainwater harvesting has been very effective and has been an integral part of the IWMP program uh, since the mid 90s. Okay. 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 So you'll find, particularly if you were to take a state like Gujarat is a good example, where you've had saline ingress from the sea, which has come in to 15, 20 kilometers inside the coastline at many places. Now, by doing uh, rainwater harvesting in the watersheds further upstream, what has happened is that you are getting clean water flowing to the villages from the upslopes and that has uh, got, reduced the salinity of the water by the uh, coastal villages. And the Gujarat has got a lot of uh, evidence of this. In Karnataka, I just wanted to share for school, school buildings <coughs> are being used for rainwater harvesting. Yeah. So that children, they get at least, you know, water free of geogenic contaminants. So that far more important, far more important reason for school buildings to do rainwater harvesting is to ensure that you've got enough water supply for your toilets. <laughs> So, uh, whatever strategy you use for the Himalayas, how would it be? would it be the same for even Western Ghats? Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, yeah, is doing it now here. Yeah. In all uh, the belt of the entire Western Ghats, or again it will be quite different. You know, where, in that Sakara, that area, no, where uh, there is uh, more vegetation versus where there is less. I mean, would see the, the, di the difference? The difference is in the geology you've got basically a hard rock area and in the uh, hard rock areas you always have to be very careful uh, with the nature of the faults in that. Now supposing you, you have a spring and you identify the recharge area and you say okay this is the recharge area let's try and uh, dig some trenches and so on. First thing is if it's really hard rock and there's no soil, where are you going to dig your trenches, right? 
let's say that you can dig your trenches. You dig your trenches, but you forgot to check for fractures. And there is a fracture in the ground, right? Charge, but that didn't last for too long because the fracture carried away the water very quickly. So those kinds of problems exist, they are much more here than in our areas. Yeah. This Dip uh, experiment, on the graph it looks very impressive. How long did it take you to convince people to shift from deep bore wells to took us about a year, year and a half, but we only worked in three villages to begin with. And today we are working in about half a dozen villages at a time, okay, but it's becoming easier. That's why we agreed with the state government that let's first take up a block in Dhar district. Pure block ko fluoride free karenge. Or fifth pure district ko cover. Staying power for the city. Yeah. And more than that, you know, uh, I hope uh, Satish ji doesn't mind my saying so, but a lot of the bureaucracy does not like this. There's no money to be made in this. Say it. Concrete an initiative which I have taken where the cost of uh, irrigation project came to 1400 rupees versus minor irrigation 12,000 rupees per hectare, per uh, hectare, 1987. Entire minor irrigation hierarchy was up in arms against me. Uh, in one encounter with a very senior officer, I was asked, do I realize that 42,000 rupees will be recovered from my salary? for violation of rules. <laughs> My simple uh, question was, uh, is if it push comes to shove, can I pay 1,000 in 42 installments? <laughs> so they realize that, but this is a problem that you face, that if you reduce the cost, then it's the same thing as why a decentralized uh, system is not attractive in municipal area. There's no big money to be made. So that's the bigger problem. Mm -hmm. Profit bhi nahi hai, subsidy bhi nahi hai. Ah, profit bhi nahi hai. So any other questions? Yeah. In the, in the spring shed, uh, you know, the recharging, uh, what in your view is the role of so you, you've done you know, trenches and uh, there was also, I guess, uh, some tree planting. Yes. Like so I mean, how important is that? I guess not in the shorter time scale. You know, I haven't really looked at how much is the contribution coming from the rent system. But Keep in mind that I said trees and grasses. <coughs> the grasses essentially is to keep the uh, moisture in the in the soil. But uh, I'll give you an example of um, another place where a friend of mine started working on this in 1988. I went to see his program in 2001. In the month of May, as you descend down the hill, he had about 1500 trenches uh, on a slope. The upper trenches were all dry. But as you came down the slope, the lower trenches were full of water. So it is, you know, that root system is supplying some water bit by bit it is the question that you ask you know what is the uh, time period over which that water is coming so I suppose uh, there is a significant contribution but I have neither done this work myself nor have I read any literature on this 
the example you cited, uh, that was again in Mushwar Yeah, that's in Mushwar yeah. uh, So there, there was a question earlier by somebody. Um, I think there's the Timbuktu uh, collection initiative in, in southern AP. Karnataka. Anand Andhra. 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 So, Andhra. Anand Anand Sindh. Anand. Yeah. so that, I guess, would be another example where you know, people people went to a region which was extremely dry, very poor soil, and were able to regenerate using essentially the techniques that you yeah. cited. Yeah. yeah, Anandpur also this participatory groundwater management is working out quite well. In fact, Andhra is doing well uh, by integrating this concept into the watershed development program. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I'm supposed to be a yeah, member of the family. Why do you yeah. have to be a member of the family? Very nice of you to come. Thank you very much.